Hello everybody and welcome to my home in West London. I hope you are all keeping safe and well. Thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction, John. Um, and thanks to all of you in my socially and physically distanced virtual audience for logging on. I'm overwhelmed that so many of you are listening to my talk this evening. Uh, probably the biggest audience I've ever had. And I'm honoured to be launching the school's new virtual lecture series. <clears throat> when I was preparing this lecture for its original date on the 16th of March, as you heard, I thought I would start by indicating how the BSA very much lives up to its mission statement that John mentioned earlier to facilitate research in all aspects of the Hellenic world. Well, by what rhetoricians call paralipsis, I have done that, more briefly than I had intended, but nonetheless sincerely. Events, of course, overtook us, and we now have lockdown and no football, either or both of which I suppose may please some people. I didn't even need to look it up to guess that the UK's current Secretary for, of State for Health and Social Care, Matt Hancock, read PPE at Oxford. That's Philosophy, Politics and Economics. Perhaps if he had read classics like his line manager, he would have recognised rather sooner the urgent need for a more useful kind of PPE personal protective equipment for our wonderfully dedicated frontline care workers. Because Thucydides warned us about the dangers of infectious diseases for frontline care workers nearly two and a half thousand years ago. As primarily a philologist, I have always felt welcome at the school and in its wonderful library despite the inscriptions that greet you as you enter through the front gate. And indeed the back gate. Now I'm not completely ignorant of archaeology. I was one of the founders of the Accordia Research Institute and I was very pleased to see our poster in the hallway when I arrived at the school in January. And I did gain some archaeological experience in the Po Plain in Italy. But that was a long time ago. Still, I was hopeful when making my application to be the school's visiting fellow that something on philology and topography might fit the bill. Remembering that my friend Karim Arafat had been the visiting fellow in 1997, with a lecture called In Search of Pausanias. And I hope the Greeks in the audience will forgive me if I regularly use the English pronunciation. So I came up with the idea, which I'd been toying with for a while, of a survey of the places mentioned in the literary texts that have been the focus of my research during my career. The speeches of the fifth and fourth century BC Attic orators. Now I suspect that many readers of these speeches, and not just I, have little or no idea where many of these places actually were, so a topographical dictionary might in due course be a useful tool for students of the orators and perhaps other scholars too. But I had little idea when putting the application together that the project could potentially be a very large and difficult one, as I shall explain shortly, and would involve stones and walking, as well as texts and sitting. So, may I thank the BSA for genuinely living up to its mission statement and giving a rhetorical philologist, lapsed archaeologist and neophyte epigrapher the wonderful opportunity to go and study at the school for, as it turned out, two months. 
I would also like to thank for their advice and support the director, the director's director, the assistant director, all the administrative and other staff who are so friendly and looked after me so well, including the two wonderful librarians, one of whose marmalade will soon be sorely missed, and the visiting scholars and superb school students who put up with me droning on and on at breakfast about Holaos. I must also thank by name <clears throat> two of my Greek friends and colleagues from the University of Athens, Rosalia Hagilabru, an expert in Isaias and constant support, and Professor Vasilis Ledakis, who drives me around and then makes me walk for miles. And how Ellie puts up with the pair of us when we're together, I do not begin to know. My heartfelt thanks to you all. It was probably in the first century BC that a canon of the 10 best orators was formulated to serve as models of pure classical Attic prose. The orators were mostly professional speech writers who composed forensic speeches for delivery by their clients in Athens law courts. The surviving corpus also contains a few political speeches, almost all by Demosthenes, and three epideictic or display speeches, funeral orations by Lysias, Demosthenes and Hyperides, though the most famous example of this genre is Pericles' funeral oration in Book Two of Thucydides. Seven of the ten orators were directly involved in politics, Again, most notably, Demosthenes, as well as his bitter rival Aeschines, and also Lycurgus, the man responsible for the texts of the three great tragedians and rebuilding of the theatre of Dionysus. But the orator I've been working on for over 20 years, who in the ancient tradition was Demosthenes' teacher, was named Isaeus about whom very little was known, even in antiquity. It's usually thought that he hailed from Halkis in Avia, which indeed is where there's a street named after him. I don't think there is one in Athens, though I've found Andocides, Lysias, Isocrates and Demosthenes. As John indicated, I'm preparing an Oxford classical text of the 11 surviving speeches and the fragments of Isaias, and I thought these would make a good sample for the focus of my stay in Athens. It was only when I sat down in the wonderful library to compile the sample that I realised just how many places are referred to by Isaias alone, over 70. And to give you an idea, there are about 60 speeches just in the corpus of Demosthenes. So the project will be large and it will also be difficult at times. My examples this evening will show just how insecure our knowledge of ancient Attica in many ways often is. I started the project then by compiling an inventory of the places mentioned in the text of Isaias and dividing them into six categories. Countries, islands, deems, other districts, polis. There are no non-polis states in Isaias, but I will have to add that category in due course. And structures. Now I'm by no means wedded to these categories, which indeed have developed as my work has progressed and I'd welcome advice on them. But I was reassured to see that some not dissimilar categories are used by Jones in his book, Rural Athens. In due course, when I've added the notes and bibliographies and geotags, I will put them into a database, 
which I hope may then become a DSA digital resource. But for now, I have just made rudimentary lists, noting the form of the word used in each case. I managed in my curtailed time in Athens to do this for Antiphon, Andocides, and 10 speeches of Demosthenes, as well as Isaias. But for the purposes of this talk, I will focus on places in Isaias. You will observe that I have used the Latinized spelling of names for the time being at least, since most Anglophone students, and probably scholars too, will be reading the orators in the Lerb or Texas translations. Here then are the countries and islands mentioned by Isaias. I wait to see from other orators whether the speaker's racist bias against Egyptians in Isaiah's 5 persisted in Athens, as it certainly did in Roman times. And here are the towns and cities. The first one, Ake, a town in Israel, is in all of our modern texts, after a brilliant 18th century conjecture by the Dutch scholar Valkenaer. Brilliant, but wrong as I have shown elsewhere, and it will not appear in mine. I've only included Athens when the city itself is mentioned, not the ubiquitous address, O Athenians. As you can see, there are not that many places mentioned in Isaias outside Attica, but this reflects the fact that Isaias' surviving speeches all concern inheritance of properties within Attica. Hence, 32 deems are named in the speeches. Along with quite a number of other districts, most notably farms. I'm not sure by Zeus about including Olympus though I know the place itself will feature in other authors. Finally, here is a list of structures, which as you can see, includes altars, bathhouses, brothels, houses and the law courts, the city gates, the prison, the public treasury, sanctuaries, shrines and temples of various kinds, statues, blocks of flats, and the treasury. I believe strongly in the value of autopsy, and so I have a lot of site visits to make, and I promise to keep out of the brothels if I find them, and hopefully the prison. And I want to accompany the entries with photographs, both old, where possible, and new. The reason for that will become apparent shortly, and it leads into my first example. This evening, I will focus on one deem in particular, which occupied me for many hours during my stay in Athens. And I will sandwich that deem between two others that are mentioned in Isaias. For each of the three provided its own motivation for the project. Three is a key number for students of rhetoric. And I'd like to end the talk with three brief examples from three other orators as well. The aforementioned Lycurgus, Antiphon and Andocides, to give you an indication of how broad the project may hopefully one day become. As I just indicated, three very different problems inspired my idea for the project. The first being descriptions of the deems in an infamous modern commentary. Take, for example, the following description of Kifisya. These are the words of William Wise, who in 1904 published what is still the standard commentary on Isaias references to which always include another adjective, monumental. I said infamous 
because Wise had little or nothing to say about his author that was positive. Now, there is still nothing wrong with his note on Kifisya for a modern reader until you get to the last word. But the description of a deem by Wise that really set me off on my journey was this one. My interest was aroused because Pioneer, as you know, was the deem of Demosthenes. Hence, it is the first deem this evening that I wish to comment on myself. Wise's note never struck me as being all that strange, perhaps a little quaintly worded. But again, it is still largely valid. He was not to know that Leopessi would become Paeonia again 10 years or so later, on the 16th of April 1915. But then I visited Paeonia with a friend, looking for the statue of its most famous son, which I thought I would find easily. But when I got there, I realised that this is now a sizeable town which is saved from being swallowed up in the urban sprawl of Athens only by the event intervention of Imitos. Nor is it so easy to find the statue, at least the one in the picture sent to me by my American friend Brad Cook. And you also discover that all the locals you ask where the statue of Demosthenes is have never heard of him a salutary lesson for us all. It was dark before I found Demosthenes Street and a different statue of the great 4th century leader who, I presume, because of the mountain, cannot have spent much time in his home deem once he'd embarked on his legal and political career in the city. My failure to find the statue the other one was all very frustrating and I'll have to go again. But on the other hand, this is the value of autopsy. It's okay sitting at a desk in University College London, where Wise was professor of Greek while he was writing his Isaiah's commentary. At the same time in the late 19th century, as the great textual critic A.E. A. E. Hausman was professor of Latin. Wise, who could comfortably match Hausmann in the bile of his writing style, could easily consult manuscripts in, at that time, the British Museum, a few hundred yards from his office, though he does not appear to have done this very assiduously. And he could look at travel memoirs in the UCL library. But in my view, I have come to realise, you need actually to see what you are describing to get a full understanding of what it is really like, as we will see presently. Especially since photographs of Paeonia from the time of Wise 120 years ago would give you a much better idea than modern ones of what it was like for Demosthenes to grow up there though I've not yet been able to find one from that period. The same applies to the home deem of the first member of the canon of orators, Antiphon, who came from Ramnus and mainly wrote speeches concerning homicide. When you have been there, it is no longer so surprising that there are Ionicisms in his Greek which have been used to suggest that he did not write certain works. Because Antiphon grew up near the sea and presumably came into contact with traders from Ionia. And his focus on homicide cases may well have been inspired by his local deity, Themis, the goddess of divine law and order. But I am cheating because the deem of Ramnus is not mentioned in Isaiah. 
Rather, as my second aim and the second motivation for the project, let us take holavos, which I will try to pronounce in the Greek way, and which, for those of you who are aficionados of the democratic reforms of Cleisthenes, gave its name, at least for a period, to the city treatise of the tribe Akamadis. In speech eight, <clears throat> the unnamed speaker tells the story of how his maternal grandfather Chiron had a daughter whose first marriage was to Nausimenes of Holalos. Chiron owned a farm at Phlia, as well as two houses in the city. And it may or may not be a coincidence that his brother-in-law, and effectively the speaker's opponent, was the rascally Diocles of Phlia. It is dangerous to speculate that Chiron also came from Phlia. In other words, that his demotic was Phlius. And John Davis is rightly cautious about this in Athenian propertied families, as is Brenda Griffith Williams in her recent commentary on the speech. But if his family was based to the north of Athens, where Phlia lay in the area of Halandri, about seven miles or 12 kilometers from the center, it would be understandable that he looked to nearby Holagos for a husband for his daughter. But that in turn raises the question, where exactly was Holagos? Was it where Trail's map places it? Little did I know a few months ago that this conundrum would reawaken in me an interest in epigraphy, inspired further by breakfasts with Stephen Lambert, my predecessor as visiting fellow. During my time in Athens two years ago as an Onassis overseas fellow, I spent a pleasant evening in the company of some Greek friends at Holagos. Now, you all know that the most famous son of Holagos was Pericles. And I duly saw the statue of Pericles that proudly dominates the area. It was only later that Vasilis Ledakis enlightened me with the information that modern Holagos is not the same place as the ancient one. One website I found is cautious, but cannot quite resist the temptation to equate the two. The record was put straight by, among others, the very fine Greek scholar Papa Hatzis in his commentary on Pausanias. However, despite all the years of scholarship on the deans of Attica, there is still no certainty or agreement where the ancient Holavos actually was. Papa Hatzis places it west of the Kephesus River to the northwest of Keramis, near today's Kamatero, and Nea Leosia, which is today's Ilion. Now the evidence for this is actually very slender. To use the adjective employed by Sally Humphreys in her new monumental two-volume work on kinship in ancient Athens. The as it were direct evidence consists of only two things. First, the fine spot of the grave marker of a woman named Antipatra, wife of Timotheos of Holaros. The problem with that, it seems to me, is that even if we knew precisely where the grave was, which we do not, this would still not necessarily tell us exactly where the settlement was 
because we would expect Antipatra to have been buried outside it, though perhaps close to it. Secondly, three lines of Menander's late 4th century BC comedy, Viscolos. The god Pan sets the scene of the play in Phili, on the slopes of Mount Parnes, and describes the grumpy old Knemon, who hates everybody, right to Hologos down there. So are not in the Lerb translation, though note that the Greek literally says the Holagians. Arnott notes that Hologos is a village 10 miles or so down the road to Athens, virtually at sea level. Now this is not impossible, but 10 miles from Phili takes you to Halandri, 12 miles to modern Holagos. And note that depending on precisely where Pan was standing, Mount Egaleos was not in the way. If Pan is imagined as standing outside the so-called Cave of Pan on Mount Parnes near Phili, the view would be something like this. Or in this picture, taken from the fort at Phili. But from here, you cannot see Camotero or Ilion, which are behind Mount Egaleos is coming in from the right. And Sally Humphreys clearly thinks the mountain was in the way. The general consensus to which she refers would, as we saw, place Holagos somewhere near Nea Leosia, to the east of Heidari, where another grave marker commemorates, in Humphreys' words, the daughter of a deemsman of Holagos. All that remains of this stone are, in fact, the words Enos, Holagos. Kirchner, the editor of Inscriptiones Graeci, tells us that the second stone was found east of the Daphne Monastery, near Hedari. And this is, and his comment on the first stone, Antipatra's grave marker, is equally vague. To the west of the olive grove, in Greek, is followed by east of the monastery of Daphne between Egalion and Cephisus. The Greek comes from the 1871 edition of Stephanos Kumanuthis, and I'm grateful to Chris DeLille of Oxford for helping me find this reference. I'm also grateful to Vasilis Ledakis for this 19th century etching of the olive grove with Egalios in the distance, though I do not think it helps much in pinning down where a small grave marker was found. Now, Eric Handley, in his edition of the Viscolos, is also one of those who put Holagos at Nea Leosia. But the problem with his note is that Nea Leosia is in fact only about six miles from Philae not 10. And I wonder if Eric realised at his desk in UCL that you would not be able to see Nea Leosia from Philae. I hasten to add that Eric was a brilliant scholar and a friend and supporter of mine. Trail 2 locates Holaos in the vicinity of Ilion at Cato Leosia. But Gom and Sandbach in their Menander commentary have a rather different version. And Humphreys admits in a note that the Discolus passage 
would also be compatible with a deemed site on the outskirts of the city. I then note that Horaros is placed ever so slightly, but ever so significantly, a little further east on the Topos text map, somewhere between Kamatero and Metamorphosi on the left bank of the Kephesus. In fact, roughly where Papahatsis placed it. This to me too is where Holaros probably was. For locating Holaros even just a little further to the west, on the southeast side of Egaleos, means quite simply that a real life Pan would not be able to see it from Philae, as Humphreys is aware. But I think that ruins the joke. The actor playing Pan would surely have gesticulated generally from the wife and neighbours here to all the people down there. We have to allow for dramatic licence, of course. Knemon's farm would not have been to the right of Pan's cave, as Pan indicates. And probably most of the audience would have had no idea where Holaros was anyway. But I suggest that Pan was pointing towards what is now Anoliosia, and then beyond that to what is now Metamorphosi, and beyond that towards Halan III, and even modern Holaros, since Knemon detests everybody. The greater the area, the more people for him to hate. Doubtless also, there is a pun on the name Holaros, holi, meaning bile or anger, as well as aros, suggesting idle farmers. And difficult farmers like Knemon remind us of another group of difficult farmers, the Akarnians, who would also be in Pan's view. Perhaps Holaros is a metonymy for all the miserable, Hesiodic-like farmers of the area known as the Plain, Torpedion, which is mentioned at Isaiah 5.22. If, however, you still wish to locate the main centre of the Deem somewhere near Neoliosia, then Parque Handley and others Menander is not really evidence for its location there at all, and we're left with only the inscription found somewhere west of the olive grove. Precious evidence indeed, but as Humphreys says, very slender. So that is not the end of the story, because there is one further indirect piece of literary evidence from the historian Thucydides. At the start of the Peloponnesian War, with invasion imminent, Thucydides tells us that Pericles, a guest friend of the Spartan king Archidamus, was troubled by the suspicion that would arise if the Peloponnesians did not ravage his lands like those of others. So he said that in that event, he would make them over to the Athenians. Incidentally, the Lerb translation of Foster Smith is misleading here. So too Gom's comment that the vivid Greek represents Pericles' words, I surrender them, release them to the state. The syntax is difficult, as it often is in Thucydides. And later sources also thought Thucydides meant that Pericles actually handed them over. But I go with the version of Jowett, Rhodes and de Romilly in the Boudet. Simon Hornblower does not comment on this in his monumental commentary, nor does he list the later sources. Instead, he notes that this story is related by Plutarch in his Life of Pericles, 
chapter 33. Hornblower, wow, wrongly says 23. And that a near doublet is found in the parallel life of Fabius Maximus, as well as a similar story in Tacitus histories. And he tends to agree with Fine that Pericles' gift was of the usufruct, not the ownership of the land. Fine, in fact, got this from Popo's commentary on Thucydides. And that is not what Thucydides or Plutarch actually says, and it surely weakens the force of Pericles' offer. We should bear in mind that by the time Thucydides was writing, he would have known that Pericles did not give his land to the Athenians. But the fact that this is a post-eventum story does not necessarily make it suspect. And Peter Rhodes in his commentary does not doubt that Pericles could have made the offer attributed to him by Thucydides. Moreover, the fact that the basic story is a topos does not mean that it is not true, especially when all the other instances are later. But regardless of all that, what the story does indicate is that the Peloponnesian army, which before invading the Attic plain, first went north to Enoe on the road to Thebes and then came back down to the Thriasian plain, was expected to march towards Athens via Holaos, keeping Mount Egaleos on the right. Heracles' concern about the safety or otherwise of his land suggests to me that it was on the route to the city, not slightly off it to the right near Neoliosia. The estate must, of course, have been quite extensive. And I note that the Greek of Thucydides says fields and houses in the plural so it was not in the centre of Holagos anyway, like, say, South Fort Ranch was not actually in Dallas. And Pericles' fears seem to be well-founded, as, according to Thucydides, the Peloponnesians attacked Cropide, which trail places to the west of Anoliosia, and then Akane, but then move northwards. So Archidemus did this and was expected to do something like this. And perhaps Pericles' land was somewhere near the red line. I wonder, after all this, if it's more practical to think not in terms of a deem centre called Holaos, but like Handley, in terms of the people of Holagos. Perhaps the core settlement of Holagos was somewhere near Neoliosia, or Catoliosia, or Kamatero. But Menander and Thucydides are not evidence for that location, but for other areas in the vicinity in which the inhabitants were called Holais. And it would have been better for Trail to say Holais in his table of the tribes, as indeed he himself lists Keramis. And as the deem of Holaos is termed in Menander and in some other epigraphic texts, a boundary stone, the catalogue of Attic deems, and the Bulutic list. Spelt, I note, with what used to be thought by philologists to be the alternative older form, Holagies, though the inscription is dated to the second half of the fourth century. Well, that's more than enough on Holagos for this evening, but you can see it has been preoccupying me. And to save your sanity, I cut out two more pages on Holagos as the deem giving its name to the Tritis, which conflicts with a boundary marker naming Keramis in that capacity. 
I suspect that the latter replaced the former after the death of Pericles, but that is for another day. Let us move on instead to my third main deme, which is called Beza. And it is the location of Beza that was the third of my inspirations for the project, though not in quite the same way as with Holagos. Beza was somewhere in the mining district of southern Attica near Lavrio. But of course, as you would by now expect, there is not complete agreement where the ancient deem was precisely. Loman placed its centre at a place called Pusipelia. I'm sorry that the picture is a bit foggy. It matches what Pusi means. But most scholars, such as Eliot in his book, The Coastal Deans of Attica, put it a little further north at modern Sinterina, based on a passage in Xenophon's Poroi. Sinterina seems the overwhelming favourite to me, but I'm not going to go further into that discussion now, you will be pleased to hear. Rather, I want to look at the passage in Isaiah where Beza is mentioned. Isaiah writes as follows. I give you the standard text and my own translation in Michael Gagarin's otherwise excellent Texas series. Commentators such as Wise tend to note that Beza is now Sinterina, and in a separate note that the distance of 300 stades from Athens is about 33 miles, wrongly wise, 34.4 is a more accurate conversion, or 55 and a half kilometres. And so it is, if you go by modern roads. But in preparing my Oxford text, I took another look at this passage, because the standard text incorporates a conjecture, and I wanted to understand why, and if it was right. In fact, if you go direct from Sinterina, or uh, to Sinterina, from Monastiraki, roughly where the altar of the Twelve Gods was, I will come back to the altar shortly, the distance is actually about 22 miles, or 35.4 kilometres. This is just over 191 stades. We do not know where in his mind the unnamed speaker of Isaiah 3 was measuring from not necessarily from the law courts in the Agora, where he delivered the speech, or where precisely the mine at Beza he refers to was. But clearly, 300 stades is far too far, and this is where it gets interesting. The source for the Greek text of this passage is a manuscript now in the British Library, named Burney 95, and commonly referred to as A. A here actually reads Enthende stadius ephus triacosius echise. And the apparently nonsensical euthus or Ephes, immediately, was corrected to Engus, Egi, nearly, by the great English scholar Dobry in 1824. He died the next year. All editors since Dobson 
1828 have adopted this emendation. However, Dobry, great though he was, was, I think, wrong on this occasion. Euthus, F. Thies, can also in fact mean direct or straight, as it does at Euripides, Hippolytus 1197. But this meaning of the adverb is very rare when used of place rather than of time. And its more common form in that sense is ephi, a bit without the sigma, a bit like the adjective in modern Greek. I think I can also explain the final sigma in the manuscript, because this was, lo and behold, the letter used with an acute accent after it as the symbol for the numeral 200. Given that 200 stades is much closer than 300 to the direct distance between Cinturina and the Agora area, I think that this is what we should read in the text. For those of you who will then ask, how did we get the number 300? I would answer that the acute accent was at some point mistakenly understood to mean taff. And lo and behold, taff with a mark is the symbol for 300. And that, that happened once the sigma had been written as part of F phi. Or perhaps it was merely a scribal guess. Whatever. For me, the text of Isaiah 3.22 should read this. And I conclude this section of my talk with the observation, thanks again to Vasilis Ledakis, who's a priceless font of local knowledge, that starting from Monasteraki and going in a straight line to Sinterina, would take you very close to a pass through Mount Imitos called the Svetia Olos. The route, I am sure, that Xenocles, Diophantus and Dorotheos would have taken to Biza. I will end this talk, as I indicated at the start, with a brief mention of three further places in three other orators, two of which are not in Isaiah's. I've already mentioned the altar of the twelve gods in the Agora, which according to Herodotus was one place from which distances from Athens were measured. Whether Herodotus and other sources prove that this was where all distances were measured from, like Charing Cross in London, I'm not so sure, but it is a convenient place from which to measure, even if the railway has been built sacrilegiously over the top of it. And the fact that it is mentioned in Lycurgus, whose one surviving speech against Leocrates as you heard John uh, kindly announce earlier, I recently translated for Yossi Roisman's commentary in the Oxford series. This means that I can include it this evening. As you heard, the book sits proudly in the BSA library, and I ought to give the library a copy of my much earlier commentary on Antiphon's fifth speech on the murder of Herodes, which was the subject of my PhD thesis about a century ago. The scene is Mytilene in Lesvos, which does feature in Isaiah several times in speech nine. One of the questions modern scholars have asked is where the alleged murder of Herodes took place because his body was never found. The speaker of Antiphon 5, who was possibly called Euxithus, 
says that the boat he was travelling on from Mitalini met with a storm. No doubt, because I believe in autopsy, the boat was not dissimilar to this one that I photographed in the harbour at Mitalini. No, not the cruise liner in the background. So the boat put in at a place in the territory of Mathimna, which may or may not have been the same place as the modern harbour of Molivos, where you get great fish dinners. Michael Gagarin, following Peter Green, decided that the place Euxithius is referring to was in fact Scala Sikaminyas. Also a nice place to get a meal these days. Gagarin comments thus. So I decided for the sake of my own autopsy to take a boat trip round the top of Lesvos. And as a result, I could see that there are many places other than Scala Sikaminyas where a boat could have put into shore during a storm. The downside of autopsy, the eye of the beholder. I also took hundreds of photographs of dolphins. Yes, they are there, but had always dived back under the water by the time I press the button. You will already have realised that I'm no David Bailey. And finally, there is this. Some people who know me know that I try to put Chelsea into every public lecture I give. And this time it is semi-legitimate. My hero Peter Osgood's goal helped Chelsea win the 1971 European Cup Winners' Cup against Real Madrid at the old Karaskakis Stadium, home of Olivia Kos. Cheer or boo as you wish, but they did beat Arsenal before the lockdown. This ground, as Fasilis Ledakis Eli and I discovered a few weeks ago, is only a couple of hundred yards from some of the remains of the long walls that were begun after the Persian Wars by Themistocles. They are mentioned several times in Andocides, but despite being a symbol of Athens' past greatness, the walls are largely neglected today, a bit like the altar of the Twelve Gods. But I thought I would finish my talk this evening with them and with my friend Themistocles. You can see that I'm only just embarking on my journey as a topographical philologist, and I suspect I have many more headaches to come in working out where places were, as well as blisters from walking to them. But I'm eager to resume just as soon as I can get back to Athens. So thank you very much indeed, BSA, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to start that journey as your visiting fellow. And in thanking you all this evening, wherever you may be, for your very kind attention, I say, Efaristo parapoli ke zito i vretaniki scholi. Thank you very much.